Heavenly Father, we pray for your spirit to manifest itself here. We know that your presence is already in the sanctuary, but we ask that we could feel it, that we could sense it, that you would eliminate the separation that sin has brought so that we could look full into your wonderful face and worship you in the splendor of your holiness. Be with me, Lord, as I preach faithfully your word. May it be true to the scriptures. May it be filled with the power of the Spirit. And may all who hear today hear clear and beautiful instruction from the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. This we pray in your Son's name. Amen. It's a new year, everyone. Happy New Year. It's weird to be saying Happy New Year two weeks into the year, but it's our first Sabbath that we're back together again. So it's still good to say Happy New Year. Another trip around the sun. Another opportunity to make this our best year yet. You know, every new year is full of potential, isn't it? Every new year is a natural time for us to take stock of our lives and to ask ourselves the serious question, what can I do to make this year better than last year? And how do we often make sure that the new year is better than the last year? By making New Year's resolutions. Go ahead and raise your hand if you've made some resolutions for this year. All right, a couple of you, keep them up. Raise the other hand if you've already dropped them or forgotten them or broke them. Yeah, yeah, a couple of us already, right? We, we don't want to admit it. We don't want to admit it, but it's true, right? Now, we know what the typical resolution list looks like, don't we? This year, I want to lose X amount of pounds. This year, I want to make X amount of money, right? This year, I want good grades in X amount of classes. That's what the typical resolution list looks like and I have to be honest when I look at that list I think it's uh I think it's a little lacking now it's not that that resolution list is bad it's just that it's missing something of vital importance when I hear many people rattle off their resolutions for the year I can't help but ask the question where is God in all of this. Even with Christians, when they say their New Year's resolutions, for some reason it seems the presence of God is mysteriously absent in their plans for the year. Is that the way it's supposed to be? Are we supposed to plan our year based on just our own wants and completely ignore God? Or is there a better way to plan our year to the glory of God? The Apostle Paul tells us that whatever we do, whether we eat, whether we drink, whether we plan the new year, we do everything to the glory of God. And so I submit to you that as we look at making 2024 our best year yet, it is not enough to ask ourselves, what can I do to bring happiness to my life? As Christians, we must also ask, what must I do to bring glory to my God? That's why we're here, brothers and sisters. That's why we are witnesses. That's why God calls us the light of the world and the salt of the earth. We are to live as embodiments of the love of God itself. And so we need to ask ourselves as we plan this year, what are we doing to glorify God and that's what I want to help you with in this sermon today. In this sermon today, I want to shepherd you to give you a few resolutions you can adopt in your own life so you can make sure that in 2024, you live for the glory of God. Let's look at them together. Resolution number one. Every year, a Christian should make it their goal to grow closer to God. Never forget, the entire core of our religion is that God saved lost sinners to be in relationship with him forever. From cover to cover, beginning to end over and over, the Bible tells the story of a God 
who wants to spend time with his people. Right after God made Adam and Eve, the very next day he created a specific day of rest because he wanted to spend time with them. It is said of Abraham that Abraham found righteousness in God and Abraham was called God's friend. God himself said to Moses, I do not speak to him in riddles. I speak to him face to face as one would a friend. And of course, we all know of Enoch, who walked so closely with God that God took that man straight to heaven without ever having to see death. Now, I'm going to be honest, if I could live like anyone, I want to live like Enoch. I want to be like that. I want to be so close to God. I see his face. I know his heart. I know his character. And Lord, take me straight to heaven. <laughs> you know, that is the life that I want. But when we, when we read the Bible, we think that that's so weird. That it's weird that these people had that kind of relationship with God. But I want to submit to you something. It is not weird that these men and women were that close to God. What is odd is that so many of us are not. The reality is that a relationship that is deep and meaningful with God, it is not reserved for the chosen few. It is open to every single Christian who wants to enter in. Jesus made you a promise. And one thing I know from my Bible is God will not break his promises. And God said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Do you want to see God? See, the Greek word for seeing there is knowing intimately. Jesus is saying that it is possible that when the heart becomes pure, that we can see God in the splendor of his holiness. We can know what it's like to love God and to be loved by God. God wants to love you. God literally begged his people, quote, make for me a tabernacle that I might dwell among them. The word dwell is fellowship. It is to love, it is to be with God. Literally begged his people, would you please just make me an in-law suite so I can come down and live with you and see you. And even when the tabernacle and sanctuary, when it ceased to be anymore, God came down in the form of Jesus Christ. And we called him Emmanuel, which literally means what? The God who is with us. Jesus himself came to be with us and he made us a promise. When he was right about to leave, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. Man, I want to see what that place is like. I don't, I don't need a mansion. I don't need golden doors. I just need whatever Jesus provided for me because I need Jesus. That's what I want when I get to heaven. I, I'm, I Look, I know you're all going to try to too, but I'm asking God, God, I want the house closest to your house. That, that's what I want. I don't need anything huge. I just want the house closest to Jesus. I can't wait to see what he has prepared for me. But he makes a promise. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back again. And I will receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Don't you want to be there with Jesus? Don't you want to be in heaven with your creator, the one who loves you, who died for you, and to this day lives to see you doing well? That's what I want, and that's what Jesus promises. The beautiful truth, if you were to ask me, what separates Christianity from all other religions, I would give you two answers. The first that separates the two is grace. Only in Christianity do you see the true grace and forgiving nature of God? And the second difference I would say to you is this. It is in Christianity that you know God as your father and you know God as your friend. Now, I'll be honest with you. I, I know the president of this conference, but I would be a little nervous to call him my friend. I don't know President Biden. I didn't know President Trump. 
But I want to show up in the Oval Office acting as if we're buddy-buddy putting my muddy feet up on the desk. And yet the God of... Some of you even feel nervous coming to my house. <laughs> you know, we got to be good. We're at the pastor's house. Now listen, listen, honey. I told you when we... Go, li listen, li listen. When we go see the pastor, you need to behave, right? Some of you are nervous to even see me, okay? And I'm a sinner just like you. And yet the sinless God says that we can call him our father and our friend. One of the precious promises I pray every night from God is I say, God, you made me a promise and I cling to it. You said, Sean, if you seek me, you will find me if you search for me with all your heart. And so I say, God, I'm seeking. I know I'm finding, but please help me to see your full face and to see you in all your glory. You see, that's a promise God made to you too. And if you seek him this year and you devote your attention to him, I promise you that you will see God in the splendor of his holiness. The first goal of every Christian every year is to grow closer to God. That's resolution one. That's the best one. If you take anything from the sermon today, let that one be it. Resolution two, every year a Christian should make it their goal to become a more loving person. A story is told of a daughter who walked up to her father and said, Daddy, what is your New Year's resolution? And the father said, Honey, Daddy only has one resolution this year. My resolution is to treat your mother so well that she believes that she is the most loved person in this world. And the girl's like, oh, that's sweet, daddy. And so she goes to her mom and says, mommy, what's your New Year's resolution? And she said, honey, I only have one resolution this year. My resolution is to do everything in my power to make sure that your dad keeps his New Year's resolution. <laughs> right? No, we laugh at that, but why? Because inside each of us is a desire to love others and to be loved by others. And Jesus says that this will be the distinguishing mark between his disciples and the rest of the world. Jesus says in John chapter 13, verses 34 to 35, he says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, Everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. You see, the truth is that Christianity is not just a religion to be believed. It is a religion to be lived. Jesus wants you to not only talk the talk, we would say, he also wants you to what? Walk the walk, right? Jesus tells us that the primary way a Christian lives is by loving every other person with the very love of God. You know, a discipline I began practicing many years ago, I should probably pick it back up, but what I have done over the years is I take the, the chapter and verse, 1 Corinthians 13, verses four through eight, that's what we call the love passage in the Bible, okay? And in that passage, there are 14 different virtues of how a loving person ought to live. And what I do is this. I pick one of those virtues and I intentionally practice it that week. So the first week I might intentionally live out a life of patience, the next week, I might intentionally live out a love of kindness. The week after that, I intentionally refrain from envy. Or to put it positively, I glorify God for the accomplishments of others. So you've all heard me tell the stories of me on 270 zooming past every person because everyone else goes too slow. Amen? Oh, you're those people. Okay, okay. I love you. Well, when I'm practicing patience, do you know what I intentionally do? I intentionally find the slowest truck, 
put my ball in. It's, it's, it's agony, honey. Yeah, you're, you're laughing because you got a left foot like me, I know. But I intentionally put my blinker on. I get behind that slow truck. I feel the anger and the wrath, you know, raised up in me. What are you doing on my road? Get off of my road. And, and, and I intentionally put myself in situations where I need to practice the patience of God. But I want to tell you something. My life is infinitely better because I intentionally practice what it means to be a loving person. You know, the Apostle Paul said to Timothy, a, a, a young boy, he was mentoring in the faith, he told him that we are all to train ourselves in godliness. That just as someone goes to the Olympics and trains their body for the sport, so we also need to train ourselves in the ways of godliness. In a very real way, as an athlete might pump some physical iron, you need to pump some spiritual iron too. You need to intentionally exercise the virtues of love. And I can guarantee you, if you do so, you as a person will never be the same again. It was Henry David Thoreau, one of my favorite authors, who said, the mind, once it has contemplated a worthy idea, can never return to its original shape. I love that quote. I have it filed in my Bible system for Bible meditation when you contemplate the word of God. But I've also found this to be true when the soul practices love. When you intentionally live a life of love, the soul will never return to its original shape. You will expand, you will grow, you will find your motives, your desires, your, your thoughts, your feelings, your actions are no longer full of sin. Instead, they begin to embody the very love of God. And when I die, I don't want my kids to stand at the grave and say, wow, daddy was a good preacher. I don't want them to stand there and say, Daddy had a big church. I don't want them to stand there and say, Daddy had more than one house. I want them to stand there and say, Wow, my dad loved God. And boy, did my dad love other people. If that can be said about me when I die, then I will say that is a life worth living. And I think that every Christian ought to have the same goal for themselves you know, so often at the beginning of the year, we have people asking themselves, how can I grow my currency in my bank account? Or instead, I think we should ask ourselves the question, how can I grow my capacity to love God's children? By this, the world will know you are my disciples if you love one another. Every year, you should commit yourself to being a more loving person. That's resolution two. Resolution three, every year, a Christian should dedicate their lives to making this world a better place. We were walking in Walmart with my, I was, with the two boys. I made, I don't know if the good decision or the bad decision to take them to the toy aisle right before Christmas and ask them, tell daddy what you want. It turned out they wanted Walmart, okay? They, everything, everything in Walmart. They didn't even know what things were. They wanted it though, okay? But we were walking in one particular section and we noticed a display case of toys that had been knocked over. And sweet little Michael walked up to me and he tugged on my shirt and he says, Daddy, do you think we should pick these up? Now, is it my job to pick those up? No. Do I work for Walmart? No. But I looked at him, I said, you're right, buddy. We should pick these up. Like I always say, wherever you go, leave the world a better place than you found it. And we picked up the toys, we stacked the display case, and we began to walk away. And as we're walking away, I hear a woman behind me go, way to go, dad. And I'm like, oh, a compliment. I'm not used to those. And, and so I turned around and she goes, I just want to tell you, sir, every father should raise their boys with that mentality. Everywhere you go, leave the world a better place than you found it. Jesus echoed similar sentiments. He said to his disciples, which includes you, you are the salt of the earth. 
Now many of us have heard, and it's true, that salt in Jesus' day was not primarily used to season food. Instead, it was used to prevent physical decay in meat. And just as salt was used to prevent physical decay in meat, Christians are used to prevent moral decay in this world. You know, it it never ceases to astound me. The sheer amount of suffering that exists in this world. Just this last week, I counseled people who were suffering from abuse, attempted suicide, depression, bullying, poverty, failing health, a loss of hope, possible loss of houses. And that was just in my own local vicinity of people I was counseling. This is not to even mention the wars that are going on, a global tyranny, global racism, global economic problems are just wiping across the world. The reality is that when we look at this earth, it is full of suffering and any Christian whose heart has been touched by God looks at this suffering and says this has got to stop it grieves us in our being to see people hurting we don't want to see this happen to people but here's the reality God calls Christians to do more than just grieve the evil in the world God calls Christians to transform the evil that's in this world. Never forget this following point. The only thing standing between evil consuming society is good people who refuse to let the darkness win. That is the only thing with God's power that keeps this world a good place. The reality is this, the sin, having goodness in a sin-ridden world is not normal. Human nature has a tendency toward evil and tyranny. And because we have a tendency toward evil and tyranny, society has a tendency toward evil and tyranny. Without people like you, who have been regenerated by the love of God, this world would descend into moral depravity. And that's why God says to every Christian, you are to be the salt of the earth. You are to be the light of the world. Service is not just something of saying thank you to someone or saying that someone looks nice that day or giving a smile or giving food to the homeless person. We look at those as if they are small, little things, but they are not small things. These ways of serving people stand in defiance of darkness and they refuse to let evil win. I remember one time at seminary, I was walking by and uh, I gave a smile to somebody and it it was a younger lady and I just said her hair looked nice that day. Hey, I like what you did with your hair. Looks very nice. You know, thank you so much. That was it. That was the whole interaction. She came later that day and said that that morning she was feeling depression. She had a bad counseling session and she just said, God, if you care about me, when I walk in the seminary building, help the first person I see to smile at me. And I was the first person. I wouldn't wish that upon many people, but you know, I was the first person and I just smiled. You look nice today. I hope you have a good day. That simple act of kindness helped lift her out of a pit of darkness and gave light to her very dark day. The reality is that when we serve, we eliminate suffering from this earth and we preserve the things that are good which make this life worth living. How are you serving? How are you serving the world? It doesn't need to be on a board. It doesn't need to be a director. It can be. But the reality is in your own sphere, what are you doing to show the love of God to others? Because by doing so, you make this world a better place. That's resolution three. Last resolution. As a Christian, every single year, you should commit yourself to sharing the good news of the gospel. 
The truth is this, brothers and sisters, we are caretakers of the greatest news the world has ever heard. And that is the news that God himself has come to this earth in the form of Jesus Christ as a perfect being died a sinner's death so that you and I can be with him in paradise forever. As Mervyn said during tithe today, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life that's the good news of the gospel and we come to church and we rightfully rejoice in hearing it we say amen thank you when 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 karen was praying today and so was john i just sat there saying i love you god thank you god for what you did thank you for forgiving a sinner like me that i could be here and tell people just how amazing you are i love that and i'm thinking and for that but then i start thinking to myself this isn't in my sermon i'm just sharing my life with you then i start thinking thinking, well, here it is, I'm praying and thanking you, God, for your forgiveness, but how many people out there don't know it? How many people out there haven't heard the gospel or who has heard the gospel but has not yet responded? And then God laid upon my heart my own family, my own sibling. I was gonna say siblings, but I only have one. My sister, my mom, my dad. When I get to heaven, am I gonna be able to look God in the eyes and say, yes, God, I did everything necessary to get them in the kingdom of heaven? Or did I shirk my responsibilities? Did I maybe not share the gospel because I was afraid to offend? I didn't want to make the Thanksgiving table a little tense over turkey, you know? Or tofurkey, not judging anybody, okay? But the reality is this. God's put people in your life that you love, that you want to see in heaven. Raise your hand if that's true. That God's put people in your life, everybody. God has laid on your heart a burden for those people. And I want you this year to lift those people to God in prayer. And I want you to ask God to soften their heart, to open them to the gospel, and to provide an opportunity for you to minister to that person. It's hard. I know it's hard. Especially for those of you who the person I just mentioned is the person you've been working on for a while. Okay, I have them in my life too. And we all know how it is. You know, look, so-and-so, if, if you turn to Jesus, look, I, I've heard the Jesus story before. I, I know how it is. Okay, I, I, I felt it before. But I've also felt it before when I begin to share that story and for the first time they look up in tear-filled eyes. And I know this for the first time in 15 years that just a little bit of the truth I just mentioned it got past that hard armor and it lodged itself in their heart. And maybe, just maybe, the Spirit can use that to turn them around to know the glory of God. God says to us, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. I do that for you. You know I pray for you, right? Actually, most of my day is either writing the sermon, counseling you, or praying for you. That's like 75% of my day, right? My knees hurt after a while because I, I get to pray for you all so often. I love it. But one of my prayers I pray consistently over you is that you would be the laborers God sends into his harvest field that you would be the people who are courageous enough to speak truth into a society that treats darkness as if it's good, who wants to treat sin as if it's something to be honored. I pray over you that you could find those loved ones, share the gospel with them, and that your loved ones are receptive to what you have to share. Now, you may have never shared with me who those loved ones are. I might not know their names, but God knows their names. And so when I'm on my knees and I pray for you and I say, as my sheep go and they share the gospel with their loved ones I might not know your loved one's name but I'm praying for them that their heart would open to the gospel of Jesus and what I'm asking you is that you would join me in that prayer that you would unite with me I want your loved ones in heaven too I I want to get to heaven 
and have the experience. I'm going to use Cece as an example just because she's sitting there. I want Cece to grab me by the shoulder, yank me to a loved one of hers that I never knew and said, Joshan, they're here because we prayed for them. And you know what? I want, I want to bring Glenn with me one day. And I say, hey, Glenn, you, you prayed for my family. They're in heaven today too. And it's because of people that prayed for the power of God and the gospel to go forth. You know who your people are. You know who you want to see in heaven with you. And I want to see them in heaven with you too. And I say that we commit 2024 to either beginning to pray for them, to continue praying for them, and to never stop praying for them. I have a close loved one who, uh, whose son was raised in the Adventist pastor's home. And when he became a teenager, he became a militant atheist. I mean, a hostile atheist. And I have to tell you, there were, who there were years in there where I really believed that if he died, he was not going to be in heaven. And I was scared at times to share the gospel with him because he knew it. He grew up in the church. How would you ever be able to, you know, get into someone's heart that was so staunchly against, uh, against God? But Megan and Linda kept this loved one of theirs in prayer for years, and it shocked everybody when he sat them down and said that now that he was in a hard spot of life, that, that he believed in God and believed that Jesus was the Savior. There's a long way to go, there's a long road to walk, but this person has accepted Christ. And so what for a decade and a half some of us thought was impossible, God did, because nothing is impossible with God. And we can do all things through Jesus Christ who gives us strength. And if you think you want that person in heaven, God wants that person in heaven a thousand times more to the point he was willing to die for that person that they could come to heaven. So if you've been praying for a loved one, it's been going on for many years, and maybe you're beginning to get a little wary, don't get wary. Do you remember that story when Moses was praying for victory, his arms got tired, and whenever his arms fell, they began to lose, and whenever his arms went back up, they began to win? Look, let's hold up each other's arms. Let's keep each other praying to the Lord, because if you put your loved one before the Lord, God will bless them. He will work on them, and through your prayers, maybe, just maybe that door will open, and they'll accept the Lord as their Savior. 2024 can be a good year. We know in this world, the last four years have been pretty tough, haven't they? They've been hard for many of us. But they are not so hard that we cannot make it through. We serve a God who knows the beginning from the end. He knows what 2024, 2025, I'm hoping it comes by then, 2026 is like, okay? He knows the beginning from the end. And if we trust him, if we live our lives to glorify him, then our God will see us through he will show us his ways. He will teach us his paths. He will guide us in all truth and he will lead us. Our Lord is our ever present help in times of trouble. So as we continue living through 2024, let us lean on the Lord. Let us resolve to glorify him. And as we continue to do so, he will lead us prosperously through this year, all to his glory.